Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Welcome back to After Hours. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala. I've taken over hosting duties uh, from Sheikh Hamad al-Shukri. I decided to open up uh, today. Um, but alhamdulillah, uh, it's an exciting uh, episode for us. Inshallah ta'ala, we have a dear friend of mine who I'm sure many of you have not been exposed to, right? When you talk about Imam Siraj, Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick, uh, these are names that have come to us through the many lectures that we've heard, through the multiple engagements that we may have had with the da'wah. Uh, our guest today is someone who is uh, a little bit different, but very insightful and can really help us understand, especially, I think, inshallah ta'ala, a lot of what has happened over the last two decades and uh, a lot of ways in which we could probably be better, ways that we may have been impacted and ways we could be better in regards to our da'wah in sort of a surveillance, a climate of surveillance, a climate of securitization. So our guest today is Dr. Tariq uh, Yunus. Dr. Tariq, alhamdulillah, is a senior fellow at Yaqeen Institute. He is a senior lecturer in psychology at Middlesex University. He researches and writes on Islamophobia, racism, and mental health the securitization of clinical settings and the politics of psychology. And I'm going to go ahead and just get to the last line of your bio. Uh, you have a book called The Muslim State and Mind, Psychology and Times of Islamophobia, which is why we really wanted you to be here. I think you're, you're, you're an Egyptian Canadian who lives in the UK. Are you Canadian or American? Egyptian American lives yeah. in Winter Canada and lives in the UK? I'm Canadian. It's blasphemy to call Canadians Americans. Astaghfirullah. I apologize. Okay. You're Canadian, Egyptian Canadian, <laughs> who lives in the UK, uh, who writes about American Muslims. Uh, so, I'm, I, I mean, it is what it is. Maybe there's some uh, some bull there, some, some hatred that you have towards you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, um, first of all, what, in, you know, tell us a little bit about how you got into this, the psychology of extremism or, or rather how a climate of extremism and securitization affects the muslim mind can you mm -hmm. talk to us about how you kind of got into this in the first place yeah of course so uh alhamdulillah uh first of all let me officially just thank you and uh for providing the space for me inshallah to to share my thoughts and alhamdulillah i should mention that uh, i'm really standing on the shoulders of many giants who've written on this subject for for many years um uh, so I won't spend too much time, you know, writing and mentioning their names, but, you know, uh, I think they, they, they know who they are. So the way I've gotten to this, actually, um, so I have a history, my, my background in psychology was really um, in sort of an interest in thinking how people around the world suffer and experience distress differently. So I had an interest in cultural psychology from very early on. But I had sort of noticed that yeah. there was there was a lack of emphasis on politics and trying to understand how our political environment uh, both shapes the therapeutic settings, but also our understanding of, you know, psychological theories, psychological techniques. <clears throat> so at the same time, I, I had done my my PhD on Islamophobia and Muslim identity. Um, and, you know, there was, you know, I've I've been working for you know i mean my almost my entire life on on issues of islamophobia and within the muslim community and lo and behold there was a place here in the uk there was in the uk there was something called the prevent policy and the prevent policy um is a is a duty here in the uk for uh health professionals or it just is generally anyone working in a public body to have due regard to identify and report individuals they suspect might be um, susceptible to radicalization, might become uh, terrorists in the future, something what we call pre-criminal space. Now that really struck me when I was in Canada, that, that really struck me as something very significant because now suddenly, you know, there was a way of really sort of investigating how the politics of mental health and the politics of psychology and securitization and all these different things and of course how muslims are racialized um sort of all they all merge together so alhamdulillah uh, i had i did a uh, you know i proposed a project that was accepted and so i did research here in the uk on the securitization of mental health settings 
And um, so that, that sort of brought me into looking at, I guess, some of the configurations of the war on terror and securitization we don't normally think about. So I've always had, as I was mentioning, I've always had longstanding interest in Islamophobia and the war on terror. Um, but I think there was less of an understanding investment, for example, on, you know, on psychology and how psychology plays a very important role in this. So that's sort of my my interest and my way in on this. So, yeah, Sheikh Hamad, you want to ask a question first? Well, yeah, I mean, the first question that pops up into my mind is, uh, you know, we've been looking at the Dawah scene over the past 20 years and how has the war on terror, terror, you mentioned Muslim identity, how has it affected our identity as far as if there are any particular broad strokes that you've seen our, our community um, change between or before 9-11 and, and post 9-11? If there are any particular like major themes that you've seen, what would those be? I think that's a very good question. I mean, I would say that wasn't, this isn't necessarily my particular expertise, especially, um, you know, just sort of making that comparison before pre and after, you know, I'm sorry, pre uh, and post. I think one of the things that the war on terror has done, um, I think quite significantly, is sort of how it securitized the longstanding question of, of Muslims in the global north. Right. So what used what to be securitized mean, if I'm not aware of, of what that word means, what does that mean? Sure. So it's rendered, I mean, at, at a very basic level, we can say it's rendered um, a question. It, it's rendered the subject, whatever it might be, let's say Muslims, a question of national security. Right. Um, potential potential risk uh, or sort of threat. You know, it, it's 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 brought it. I, I think risk is actually perhaps the best way to frame it. It's put it into it's it's put it into a risk framework, right? So, how how do we understand the, and under, uh, the perceived sort of potential of risk that this thing has? Um, and and of course, not to say that that didn't exist before, but I think it's brought it very much in the limelight through different policies. So a lot of public policies. You know, it's not just we're not talking in the abstract here, the way Muslims became securitized through the war on terror, you know, it, post 9-11 was through the institutionalization and legitimization um, of different, you know, strategies and policies, which which in many cases explicitly targeted Muslims nowadays are much broader, but still very much target Muslims. Um, and to sort of answer then that question a little bit more directly, I think the one thing that I think struck out to me, so because I, I actually grew up in Germany uh, and I have ties to Denmark. So, you know, I had traveled uh, and I'm, I'm familiar with the Muslim communities, you know, in Canada, here in the UK, in Germany, in Denmark. And I think one thing that that struck me was how, you know, you know, the, the question of the Muslim of Muslims, like Muslim presence and sort of li secular liberal societies have always existed. But what used to be sort of encapsulated within integration. Okay. Of it, sorry, is it cutting off for you too, Alma? No. Oh, sorry, I started cutting off on my end. I'm so sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so no, I was just going to say what used to be sort of, um, what used to be sort of ingested within integration debates, like, you know, before 9-11, it used to be like, Either either you're like us, either you integrate into our values, or you know get out of our country, right? That that was sort of the discourse that was targeting Muslims, and you know that that was sort of the question. Um, I feel personally, post 9/11, what security, what 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 the war on terror has done is that it sort of securitized that integration discourse, right? So now it's no longer integrate into our values or get out of a country, it's really integrate our values or your potential threat to national security. Um, and we see very much how that, um, uh, you know, sort of became embedded, you know, across, across the global north, we see here in the UK, Germany, Denmark, uh, in Canada. So it's, it's something whereby it's, it's laced our, the entire um, you know, what we would say sort of Muslim thinking 
or Muslim behaviors, Muslimness, uh, within a framework of risk. So uh, it's, it's really interesting you're talking about the global north, but what I'd be curious to ask you is, you know, so you wrote your article for Yaqeen, in fact, on counter-radicalization, and I don't remember the exact title, but something on counter-radicalization, uh, the industry of counter-radicalization um, a few years ago. And I remember the first time that I went to the United Kingdom um, after Prevent, and um, that's when it was, I guess, in its initial phases, and, and uh, I know it's still aggressive, but it seemed even more aggressive at the time. I don't even remember what year that was. But is there a difference between Prevent in the UK, CVE in the US? It seemed like there were different levels, different layers of how involved that securitizing was going to be in like things like even like what Muslims are allowed to teach in schools and like, does the beard become a threat? Like basically it seemed like almost Prevent was the, the worst culmination of what's already a monstrous industry of CVE here, like Prevent was the worst form of what CVE could become in the U.S. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really good question. Um, and to be honest, I would say it's different. I think the, the issue here is of obviously comparing it between countries. Is that, you know, they have different forms of governance. Um, you know, here in the UK, it's it, it was much more feasible to sort of create a national structure of prevent than it would be in the United States. Um, whereas where there, you know, a lot of the different forms of CVE um, were sort of, uh, you know, they were they were state organized or, you know, even locally within different cities. Um, so I think it's certainly different. Now, I think by even by saying that, I should also emphasize one more difference. I think Islamophobia, you know, despite the global dimension of Islamophobia, which is very important to emphasize that, you know, I think we we can we can localize Islamophobia in, into different contexts. The way, for example, in France, it's very much a question of the presence of Islam in and Muslims in sort of um, you know secular French uh, society. Whereas here in the UK, the, emphasize might, the emphasis might be less overtly on like the place of Muslims in British society, right? Here, that, that discourse is less salient towards just the wider sort of securitization of Muslims in terms of managing who is an ideal British Muslim, right? And sort of integrating those within the institutions. Now, I think Islamophobia operates differently. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say one, at first, it's very difficult to say if one is more or less severe than another. Um, certainly, I think, in obviously, in other contexts across the world, if we think about in China, um, you know, and other places uh, where Muslims are very explicitly managed through security um, apparatuses. But I, I, I think- no, the, you, don't, you don't see France as being more severe than the UK, for example? Uh, I think so. I mean, I think severity is see. I think severity is something where, like, I don't. I let me say it this way. I don't see a point in comparing here the severity. I think the reason why I really wanted to, you know, to mention that is just because I think there are um, there are international sort of collaborations and structures when it comes to CVE in the first place. So it is more more or less a global industry now because it translates obviously in a very particular way in France, uh, where Muslims are obviously shut down, but we got to remember, you know, here in the UK, you know, Muslim organizations are also, uh, especially those that work towards Muslim civil rights are highly vilified here as well. Um, and I think there are different ways, there are different disciplinary structures here. Um, you know, there are Muslim segregated prisons in the UK, which many people don't know about. Um, which might not exist in other countries where, um, you know, we might expect Muslims to have it potentially worse, Allah Adam. So I think what we're seeing, first of all, is a closer convergence of how security takes place because of its industry, because things like ideas of like, um, like, for example, one thing we had just found out, oh, well, I didn't find it out, but it was found out through a freedom of information request that the surveillance um, 
apparatus, secure, um, sorry, the camera surveillance apparatuses that uh, was uh, were developed in China and, and used on our Uyghur brothers and sisters are actually employed, uh, were purchased and employed here in London boroughs. Uh, in several in several areas around London, so the, from the you know the technology, the company, and everything is sort of you know was sort of brought in and integrated here. Um, and so what we're seeing, I think there's a lot of convergence, and I think we have there's a lot of what we have to focus on the convergence, but also the differences. But I, I don't think we need to necessarily be hung up on the differences. I think more or less there's a lot of convergence. Do you no. think the, um, you know, so I th it's interesting, you, you bring up convergence, you know, when you talk about um, structures of oppression, India and Israel, for example, I think it's very clear, right, what you see the Modi and, and Netanyahu type of alliance and what that's led to, um, the different types of softwares that are even being used to hack phones and, and crack down on global dissidents worldwide. But I think as far as, you know, Sheikh Hamar and I, uh, what we're really most interested in getting to is our own psychology and the, the way we've spoke about been speaking about our own religion right so it seems like there is a tendency to, to really sort the good muslims out from the bad muslims the good muslims are the muslims that will pledge undivided loyalty to the state that will not criticize the security apparatus perhaps and sometimes especially here in the united states that's deeply embedded with zionism and and support for israel um that will uh, relinquish any type of voice for our political prisoners. It's one of the most frustrating and heartbreaking things in the world to see mainstream Muslims unwilling to name Dr. Afia Sadiq or Imam Jamil Amin or the HLF5 or so many other prisoners, even some who maybe are in prison for thought crimes. Maybe they did say something really stupid on, you know, AOL Instant Messenger, you know, but you don't see people going to prison for 80 years because they said something outside of the scope of Islamic or, or uh, weighing in on Muslim uh, issues, uh, even if they were dangerous ideas, right, uh, for that many years. So it's the relinquishing of our brothers and sisters uh, that are either entirely innocent or, or it seems to be disproportionately uh, punished, um, you know, for thought crimes. So I think what we're trying to get to is how do we really take a step back now, I mean, and, and say, how do we have our authentic Muslim identity if we're operating under this cloud, right, of counter-radicalization and, and the sphere of being put in the bad Muslim category, right? That that means for du'at and for, I mean, institutions being shut down in certain countries, being targeted by security agencies, being turned away at airports, right? Um, having bot armies, <laughs> Uh, I think I've, I've spoken to you about this, like uh, there are bot armies that attack us um, that are clearly from foreign countries, right? Like it's a, it's, a, it's a weird industry as a whole and indeed global because those bot farms are not being operated out of the United States from what I can tell, right? How do we still maintain sort of our strength, our dignity psychologically, not use the terminology that even relegates us to that uh, to accept that framework. You know, some would even challenge the term Islamophobia, that we've spoken about Islamophobia so much that we forgot the Islam part. You know, that's a challenge that that some people put forward. We've been so, you know, insistent upon fighting Islamophobia that we've reinforced it in the process. Yeah. I just ask you like eight questions. So, you know, you can use Germany to answer one, Denmark to answer one, Muslim to answer one, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I think I can hardly leave this room to, to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, you know, just being Muslim, even if it's a Muslim psychologist, Muslim psychiatrist, therapist, whatever, we we live in we live in times where that's not necessarily immediately designated as a safe person to go speak with, right? So I think there's a lack of political consciousness, uh, especially among Muslim therapists. Uh, my book, in in fact, really speaks to that point um, that we sort of have to politicize. Much of our work so people i even get non-muslims um come to me you know because they're like okay this person has uh some sort of political consciousness political sensitivity towards you know various issues um and so i can talk to him about it so i only do i do it by design just simply because there's no one else who they would speak with um and to take from them i think very much 
you know, I think one thing that that always strikes me, um, and this is very anecdotal, but obviously one thing that strikes me as a common chord uh, among all our brothers and sisters who've been who've experienced, you know, the 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 sharp edge of security, is that the community let them down in some shape or form, um, and you know, and I think we have to come to recognize how that's happening and why that's happening. And it's not very difficult to really understand, right? Uh, you know, um, we, we understand that these, by, by nature, you know, the war on terror, the good Muslim, bad Muslim, it's highly moralizing. You know, the way George Bush said it, you know, you're either with us or against us. So now everyone who comes close to these figures, um, you know, are, you know, there's that just that proximity, that closeness to people have been securitized and seen as something that puts you, um, and I would say legitimately so, it's actually within the security gaze, within the security logic, the closer you are to such individuals, the more you, you're higher on that, you know, that risk evaluation, which I'm talking about, which I was talking about previously. So I think there's something whereby we as a community um, have to look at the most vulnerable among us uh, and really establish ourselves in a way that um, protects those even 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 you know had they said or even done things um that we obviously disagree with you know they're still worthy of of rights and I, I mean that very sincerely because what we see in fact is that they're almost entirely stripped of their humanity um in, in a, and abused in ways that that are indescribable um so I think we and it's not only it's not only for security I think we can think about that that logic in many different ways I mean think about how many undocumented migrants who arrive to Europe um are Muslims right and what sort of institutions policy not policies but what sort of institutions and community efforts we've been able to develop and engage all these all these migrants who've come uh, who need support. Um, again, you know, there's, I think those who are most vulnerable among us are often falling through the net. Um, and I think that's something that we definitely have to work towards. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, obviously we need stronger solidarity on that, on that basis alone. I obviously, I, I feel like I can, I can talk to that, that question for a long time. Well, so Dr. Talk, maybe I can hone it in for you and in this regard. Like, look, I, I want to speak in the language of, of, of an objection that I heard from that. And I'm sure Sheikh Hamar has probably heard this as well from, from multiple imams. Um, you take, let's take the most like who I think in, in, in the United States, the person that like people are least likely to touch would be Afia Siddiqui, right? HLF5, you'll have some noise with the Holy Land Foundation, especially here, like in Dallas, they were very well integrated into the community. Imam Jamil Amin uh, led a community. So uh, and, and plus, he has a, a rich legacy of being well embedded um, into African American history in the United States, right? I mean, led the Black Panther Party prior to that student nonviolent coordinating committee. I mean, it, he was a legend. He is a legend. H. Rap Brown, prior to being Imam Jamil. So you have that contingent that sort of comes out. Uh, Af Dr. Afi Siddiqui was not an Imam, doesn't lead a community. Um, you have the accusation that she supports Al-Qaeda. Her nickname is literally Lady Al-Qaeda, right? And I've never met a single supporter of Dr. Afia Siddiqui that supports Al-Qaeda, but hey, her nickname is Lady Al-Qaeda. If you're anywhere in proximity of Lady Al-Qaeda, you must have sympathies towards Al-Qaeda. Um, we had the synagogue hostage situation, horrible situation here where, you know, six innocent people are taken hostage by a guy claiming to be doing so to free Afia Siddiqui. Now, you can use the quote from Ramsey Clark that says that she, this was the he, the former, um, I believe, attorney general who said something along the lines of that this was the worst case of injustice he'd ever seen in his in his career. But when what I'm getting to in terms of a question, right, is you ask people to come out and just demand like some basic transparency with her case. She, the woman's been abandoned. And the imams... And, and multiple folks, I don't want to put everyone in a category, a lot of people genuinely can't make it out there, right? But they'll say that, look, her case is a done deal. Um, 
Imran Khan is not the Prime Minister of Pakistan. He was the one hope that was kind of there to invoke a prisoner exchange. He's not even an American citizen. Why even soil ourselves and get ourselves in trouble here by taking on the plight of the single prisoner that is going to get us tarnished with Al-Qaeda? You know, like why even do it? And I mean, it is deeply uh, inconvenient to get four S's on your boarding pass and be held for six, seven hours and be interrogated for a case that you don't even believe is reasonably uh, you know, within reach anymore of a solution. Obviously, there's the tawakkul part, the trust part, but I think that's what I want you to maybe speak to for us is when someone says it's not worth it uh, for us because we need to still do da'wah. We need to still be able to operate freely and, you know, as imams and as du'at and as people of da'wah to take on the baggage of these political prisoners, especially the ones who are just so much um, misinformation surrounding them and toxicity surrounding them that we will inevitably be tainted. Like, what would you say to those imams, to those du'at that, uh, you know, psychologically, well, well, empathizing maybe, like, like, okay, I understand. You maybe think that it's better for me to be able to give khutbahs and give lectures and not be harassed and not be turned away from countries and go through the screening of this counter-radicalization, you know, uh, monster in different parts of the world. But what do you say to, to us uh, all collectively from a psychological perspective? Yeah. That's, uh, I, I would say that's probably the golden question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, obviously, and I think we can, we can all have different positions on this. And I think it's, it's definitely uh, important that we actually really, set, I think we, we really should be phrasing that question exactly as directly as, as you're doing right now. I, I think, let me, let me just begin with the fact that it's, it's, it would be incredibly depoliticized. Um, I'm I'm using that word sort of to be politically correct, and I because I don't want to I don't want to use any other stronger word. But I think it would be a very um, let's say politically naive position to think that okay, if I close my eyes to our sister Afia Siddiqui, that everything is going to be all right then for myself and for my family. I think, uh, you know, in the wisdom of the way Allah created, you know, our societies and just the nature of the world, you know, one experience of one person is immediately revealing of the experiences for us all. And I think if, if we don't learn anything from her experience and how what, what it reveals to us about our community and how Muslims are securitized and how and how uh, Muslims are obviously racialized through conflicts of the war and terror, but also through paradigms like nationalism, et cetera. If we don't, if we can't make sense of that, um, then, you know, the worst is yet to come. And I discuss a case, you know, for, for, for an individual like this who comes to me and would make that point if they think they can just distance themselves or even worse, I might say, play the good Muslim, right? Um, you know, they say, well, no, you know, I'm going to just keep condemning terrorism. You know, I'm going to play the good Muslim. Um, to that, first of all, I really do believe personally that anytime anyone plays a good Muslim consciously, they are at the very, at the very same time with the very same brush stroke, they're throwing someone else underneath the bus, right? Like if I'm passing a security agent. And I say, oh, no, look at me. I'm a psychologist. I'm a senior lecturer at Middlesex University. You know, why are you going to take me aside? Now, all of a sudden, the next Muslim who comes by, who's not a psychologist, you know, who hasn't been blessed with all the privileges that I've been blessed with, hmm. might even have a certain history. You know, I immediately in that brushstroke, I've thrown them under the bus by putting myself uh, as as someone who's on the sort of morally correct side, so I, I, it's really important for me to emphasize that point because I think we tend to for, we tend to forget that. Now, I, I think one of the cases that I bring up in the security chapter of my book um, is that, and this speaks to the whole question of Dawa, that I think um, sort of the, the subject here is that there's it was about a brother. Um, it was sort of a risk assessment. So from a probation officer here in the UK, they did a risk assessment of, of a brother here. 
And in the risk assessment, they're highlighting things like, oh, this Muslim's, um, you know, sort of deep empathy for issues concerning the Ummah, right? Their, their concerns for oh. the, the people of, of Syria, right? They're, you know, that they're, they're really sort of emotionally invested in, in others. And what we're going to see, my response to someone who thinks that they can just distance themselves is in fact that what we're seeing is that Muslimness itself is securitized. Right. Like, and I think that's that's the issue. You can't escape it. Now, um, you know, you may distance yourself sort of as a performance, but that won't protect your children if they ever go out and say, well, you know, I'm really concerned for Palestine. I'm really concerned for our brothers and sisters, you know, in Syria or just brothers and sisters around the world, the very concept of the ummah you know, belonging to something maybe a little bit with a little bit more importance than the nation state uh, or literally anything else, just just being racialized as a Muslim through through whatever behavior, whatever, you know, whatever garment they're wearing. That that's the main issue here. You know, Shafia Siddiqui is just one very obvious example that technically we should all be able to rally upon. Um, but there's there's no saving yourself, you know, by just by just putting yourself away. And that's, I think, often the thing that's often also the most traumatizing. I use that word perhaps a little bit loosely here. Um, but, you know, among so many brothers and sisters I've been seeing who, became, who, you know, or and their families, you know, who one of their family members got, you know, um, you know, got in some sort of, um, you know, were taken by a border police or whatever it might be. Is that it? It's there's this earth shattering element to it. Like, oh, you know, they <laughs> they would they can they can convincingly try to tell us that they didn't try to come close to sisters. Obviously, they could, but it happened anyway, right? It happened for just by nature of how how racist the security apparatus really is. And so, you know, it's either we mobilize on it, or it it it's it just keeps harming us uh, and the harm looks like it's a, it's getting worse and worse. So um, just uh, when you mention like, it, it seems like it's getting worse and worse. That leads me to the question of, is the CVE apparatus, is it generational? So growing up when, when we came of age, we came of age post 9-11 and it felt like we were just by being a young Muslim, you were under intense pressure and it was something that everybody was aware of constantly like we used to ask the question when anybody would come back from any trip any trip any of my friends anybody that I knew of my entire generation we would always ask each other how was customs you know did you get two hours did you get five hours did you get one hour did you get no and now it seems like uh Muslims who are coming of age now they don't seem to have these concerns they don't really feel the prevalence of the state in the same way or in the security apparatus that that we might have and so is it really getting worse or is it getting better I mean that's a probably a very good research question um I I think it depends on what we mean by that right like I think if we mean sort of these explicit um sort of maybe border experiences we wanted to find out just by that I think that would be a very uh maybe a little bit too of a hyper specific encounter right if we think about though issues of self-censorship right of like hey do you share your political views in your classroom you know subhanallah there was an adolescent muslim girl who i think she was 17 years old and you know she shared with me that she's been self-censoring herself for years she's 17 but for years she's been self-censoring her her thoughts her views on things for fear of you know of the impact that might have um, and of course, she's normalized that. Um, but, you know, I, I think certainly, 
you know, and this, by the way, that that's been also sort of affirmed in research in universities here, at least in the UK. Um, but I, I can imagine across, you know. Well, I feel like the self censorship the Muslim community has been doing for twenty years. I mean, there are certain topics that we just all understand that we're not going to approach and we're not going to present on and we're not going to teach classes on and things of that nature. And so that's just become embedded. So that that's a great point. Yeah, and I think I mean, I. I yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I think the thing that we've yet to really capture, if we just stick with that adolescent girl, is that I think we as a community, we haven't really fully captured. I mean, we can we can just say, like, if we try, we might quantify that and be like, OK, she's just one among many girls or um, among I mean, among many Muslims who've been self-censoring themselves. OK, so we can do some kind of statistical survey. But have we really appreciated sort of the qualitative impact that has on an, on an, on an individual to self-censor themselves for so many years, right, during adolescence. I think we as a community, uh, I know certainly in research that hasn't been appreciated whatsoever, but we as a community have really done very little to capture and support um, such individuals. Um, and so I think, I, I need to mention that I don't think the war on terror is the you know, be all and all issue that concerns Muslims. I think the issue of Islam and Muslims in the global north has long preceded, obviously, the war on terror. Um, you know, liberalism itself in many ways has fashioned itself vis-a-vis -vis Islam, um, you know, through Orientalism and other things. So, you know, I think there's, I think the war on terror is just an instance of, you know, of what we're experiencing, um, which, you know, we really have a lot of precedents to be able to mobilize on, um, but, you know, we're not, uh, oh, actually, well, I will say those who are, mashallah, may Allah bless them and, uh, and, you know, and, and make, um, you know, make their work easy for them and, and reward them for everything that they do. But, um, you know, it's, uh, there's also an evolution in the war on terror, which we haven't spoken about. I don't know how much time we have to be able to <laughs> enter into that discussion, because I think the war on terror has also evolved over the last 20 years. And I think that's also made it very difficult for us as Muslims to capture. But um, how has it evolved? How has it transformed? Well, I mean, it's evolved, certainly, uh, as an industry. It's become far more integrated, not only within, you know, within policies and governments, but also if you think about surveillance capitalist industries like, you know, Facebook, Twitter, you know, so it's it's become far more integrated as as literally uh, a population wide solution. I thought those were social media apps, surveillance capitalist. Sur yeah, I call them, sur I, I call it like That's really good. <laughs> because they, they literally bank on us, right? So we're the were the products um and that's 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 how they make so much money um you know they're selling us essentially um it's not my term i'm taking it from shoshana zuboff's really excellent book called the age oh, of it, it's fine but when we're talking to an academic i just like to poke a little bit sometimes on, on their <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think everyone listening should definitely know that uh if you're on social media you're the product right so everything that you do click on whatever it's all being sold onwards and i think it's important one, for us one, to... one person once told me if it's free the product is you that's it that's all there is. <laughs> i think we need to remember that. Uh, but yeah, in, in its evolution, it's, it's really being sold as, um, you know, CVE and all the security policies are being sold as sort of like the protectors of society, right? Like sort of the vanguard of society. In fact, it's being sold towards Muslims as as protection from the far right, from, from fascism, um, from nativism and racism, etc. So we're seeing an evolution whereby, you know, it's sort of taking a colorblind approach. Oh, we can, you know, through security, through CVE, um, sort of capture or identify and capture anyone who can be a potential threat. Um, now, again, that's highly racialized because the threshold of what makes a white person sort of pop out in the security, the security logics is much different than the thresholds, the many thresholds, which makes a Muslim pop out. Um, 
And the colorblindness then also becomes far more difficult for us to mobilize on and address because they can say, oh, we're not going after Muslims. We're going after everyone, right? And, you know, Michelle Alexander, she talks about that really well and sort of the mass incarcer incarceration of Black youth in the United States. You know, the colorblindness of police, uh, of police work, you know, makes it difficult to point out the racism, even though the, the incarceration rates are incredible. Um, so I think this, these evolutions, that's just one form of the evolution, the colorblindness of it, has, makes it more difficult for us to mobilize on these issues. Uh, SubhanAllah, I'll, I'll say that, you know, in closing, because I know we got to wrap up. First of all, we'll probably have you for a part two, inshallah, because what you just mentioned with, uh, I think, the far right Muslims um, seeing these same tools now as protection for themselves could could be deeply problematic. And, and I think that this has also been one of the things that we've been sort of um, trying to tackle or we're going to try to tackle is like sort of the, the pendulums, you know, so from, from Muslims being conservative to being taken um, you know, to, to the liberals as saviors. And even though those are reductionist comments usually, but there's something, there's some truth to that, I think for sure, Muslims sort of swing with, uh, you know, who will embrace them uncritically. And that certainly has some, um, you know, some, some very perceived and sometimes unperceived reality uh, with the surveillance uh, capitalism. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true. Like we, we, you know, it's like, a lot of times when these tools come out, it's like, hey, we're sick of being disproportionately targeted. Why can't you target other populations as well? And we might be actually feeding the industry, right? And uh, personally, and I benefited a lot from you. Um, I know you don't like hearing that, but but really, I, I benefited a lot from you um, very early on. Um, just just your insights on, you know, how how we may have been reinforcing certain concepts and the way we were speaking about these things, because certainly... I mean, when you're an imam, you're you're in the spotlight. You want to rush to condemn something, right? Because our job as imams is first and foremost to give people Islam. And so sometimes it's even just this this reaction, like these people are tainting our beautiful religion. We want to distance ourselves as much as possible from these people that are trying to taint our uh, beautiful religion. But sometimes it's the words that we use, uh, the way that we weigh in, um, where we could still distance ourselves from violence without feeding an industry that's been very violent towards us as a community. So I, I appreciate you a lot. Jazakallah uh, khair, your insights. I think that um, we have a lot to learn as people in Dawah and as institutions about how we've been impacted and how we can be more impactful in a good way, inshallah ta'ala, with the securitization of the Muslim community. So we'll have you for a part two, inshallah, um, for sure. And I'm going to ask one question because I've got an Egyptian and a Sudani with me and I can't, I cannot, uh, you know, lose this opportunity. In your full honesty, Akhtariq, uh, Sudani fool or Masri fool? Just be real. Which one's better? I mean, let me say this. Egyptian food is so bad that wow. food is our only... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's our only sort of shining glimmer of hope to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have we have to give we have to give it to Egypt. I don't think we really have it. You know, you're a, you're an honest man, and I. <laughs> but I'll say even your food does not come close. The Sudanese food is, is levels. Levels. Don't take it away from us. I know you guys have macaroni bechamel, so you can keep that. But bechamel is, is is awesome. Yeah, I was going to say bechamel is the bomb, but I'm like, no, I'm talking to a guy who talked about not using certain words, you know. <laughs> 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 but bechamel is great. It's one of my favorite foods in the world. <laughs> we appreciate you, inshallah. For everyone else, we'll see you on the next episode of After Hours, inshallah.